It's always a good song, that um, survey the wondrous cross. What we do is uh, when we realize what God is having us do today, we realize it's the most important thing we can do. So what we try to do here at Grace and Masters is make that the important thing, um, realizing that there's a lot of things that do distract us and can't keep us from doing what God would want us to do in this life. And, um, and yet there's one thing that is eternal, one thing that matters. So uh, we're trying not to play around here. We're trying to get down into some Bible study to know what God's doing. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, coming out to Grace Ambassadors. Without you, uh, our recordings wouldn't be possible. Um, thank you. Yeah. And, and without you uh, participating and, and being here, uh, we wouldn't continue to do what we're doing. So it, it's fun that, that you're a part of our ministry and that you participate in what we're doing. Um, we've had more new people come out the last month and a half, I think, than um, the, the whole first of the year. Uh, combined. So that's kind of a neat thing and your presence uh, really does adorn the doctrine. Um, when people come out and they see you here, they see people excited about studying the Bible, knowing God's will, doing ministry work, uh, it's something that, that really garnishes God's word and God's truth. Um, as you know, it's, it's so easy for people to get turned off from a teaching because of the way it looks and because of the way uh, our church is in a cornfield in Swayze, and we're not the biggest church in Greentown or in Kokemore or in Indiana or anything like that. And so th these kind of superficial things can turn people off from the doctrine. And though it should not be that way, it is. And so um, every effort that you make uh, to be here, to be a part of what we're doing, and to, to learn the doctrine and be able to communicate it is just all, all the greater. I, I remember a few weeks back, um, well, we had 20 or 30 new people come on Sunday morning, and um, uh, and the people that were here, they're part of Grace Ambassadors, uh, they understood how to rightly divide. We, people understood because we've studied over and over again. And so I couldn't get around and talk to everybody. There's too many new people. And yet there are people who knew who can go around and talk to people about, you know, the gospel and what they learned and, and uh, you know, where they come from and that sort of background. So it's neat to have that equipment um, available and present in you also. Thank you for being a part of that. Um, Anyway, this week we're continuing our series in Acts chapter 2 on Tuesday. So we're going to start Peter's sermon to Israel in Acts 2, verse 13 and 14. And uh, we'll pick that up then and continue the chapter next week as well. Um, this morning, as our pattern has been the last month, we're continuing an end of the world event series. So the end of the world is over, September is gone, but we're still talking about it here. Uh, you need to know uh, to equip yourself uh, when you have conversations in the future, because no doubt the end of the world will happen again. And uh, I saw a, a cute little picture that someone had created, a uh, snarky little thing where they had this uh, get out of a hell free card or something like that. And if you've survived so many times of the end of the world that you can go to heaven for free, you know, and you can mark down, well, 2011, 2012, you know, 2015. I've survived it three times already in the last few years. So uh, if you know what the Bible says about the end of the world events, then it'll help guard you against falling into the air falling into the hysteria, falling into the, 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 the confusion that exists around things happening in the world. So um, that, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, any comments or questions before we get started this morning in our lesson? Any thoughts? All right. Well, if not, let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. All 66 books, prophecy and mystery that you've revealed and made known your will for the ages. And we thank you that we can understand what you'd have us do today. And also, as we study this morning, what your purpose will be in its completion for Israel. We thank you that you are a God not of confusion, but a God that makes things clear. We thank you for revealing to us the knowledge of your salvation and how you can save sinners from death and hell. And more than that, give us a complete position worthy of honor and glory. And we do all these things for your glory. Amen. All right, folks, turn to Daniel chapter 9. This is our second lesson on the tribulation. When people talk about end of the world events, the tribulation is typically what they have in mind. Uh, the tribulation being those apocalyptic end of the world disasters that are described throughout the Old Testament prophets and also in Revelation with the seals and the trumpets and the vials. And so people are constantly looking for these evils, these dangers, these uh, disasters that are occurring as signs of the time of when Christ will return in the end of the world. Uh, Matthew 24, of course, we've covered briefly before how Jesus, when asked, when will these things be, Jesus starts explaining some of these disasters and some of these signs that will happen before the coming of the Lord. 
Uh, last week was the first lesson we did on the tribulation. We prefaced that with an introductory lesson about studying prophecy in general, which is important for you to get, to know that prophecy is not mystery, and we live in the dispensation of grace, uh, where God's operating according to his mystery that has been revealed to the Apostle Paul. You are here, okay? We are not in the time of prophecy. That will help you greatly when studying scripture. Also, we understand the next thing on God's timeline, if you're going to put it on the timeline, that he does as far as the miraculous intervention in the world is to take his church off the planet. So I draw that with the green arrow here where he removes his ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who's in a nation that's not their own. They're in a foreign territory and they're, 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 their job is to communicate a message, to represent. And we represent the head of the body of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching his gospel to a world that's rejected him. There's not a single nation on the planet that has trusted the Lord, that is God's nation. Uh, they're all fallen. The mystery is that Israel itself, the only nation God has established, is fallen in this dispensation. And so all are counted under sin, that God would have mercy upon all. Our job is being ambassadors of that mercy, the ministers of that reconciliation. When God's done offering his grace to a world of sinners, uh, and he, he's decided in his mind that he's going to return and fulfill all things that the prophets have said, he will remove his ambassadors from this earth, and then he'll send his soldiers to, to judge and make war. Okay? So we have that rapture, which is popularly called, that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, that is what we're looking for. Titus chapter 2, the rapture. Uh, Paul calls it the blessed hope. 1 Thessalonians 4 calls it the, the catching away to meet the Lord in the air. Okay? Very different than his coming to the earth and hitting the ground on Mount, Mount of Olives um, there in Zion. Uh, we are to meet the Lord in the air and there we'll ever be with the Lord. Okay? So that's our blessed hope, to be with the Lord in glory in heaven. Our affections are up there. Uh, following that, when the church is removed, God will then resume his purpose with the earth to fulfill his plan and purpose for the earth. Uh, and that will begin with this time of tribulation, which we defined last week. Uh, so we define, identify what it's called. There's lots of names given to it in the scripture. And we wrote down that, that name tribulation or great tribulation being distinguished from uh, just normal everyday tribulation that we face in the world in this dispensation. This is the time of great tribulation, such as was not ever since the world began. And so we, we said last week, if, you, if you're living in times that are not the worst times that's ever been since the world began, that's one way you know you're not living in the Great Tribulation. Okay? The main way you know is that you're not the people of prophecy, you're the people of a mystery. Okay? So it's called the Great Tribulation. In Jeremiah 30, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, we studied the, the different names given to it last week. Identify what it was. It was a time of wrath, a time of God's righteous judgment on the earth. And we didn't get around to the details of it at the end of last week, so I want to cover it this morning, the purpose of the tribulation. Okay, what, why is this going to happen? What is God's intent of having these things occur? The tribulation, his return, Armageddon. What's the point of all this? Because we can get, we can get really caught up in the details of studying, and I know people are just waiting for me to draw the six seals and the seven trumpets and the seven vials, and they want to, but that's not the point. You see, that's not the point of studying the end of the world events. And that's what the big distraction and diversion is. Okay, no one ever asks, what is God trying to accomplish in all this? What's the point? Okay, what is the purpose? And we need to know that, because when you do, I think, again, it will help you discern the times. Remember when uh, Jesus came in his earthly ministry and he talked about uh, some of these things happening, and they, and they asked him directly, uh, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? And he, and he condemned them, saying, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. Right? He says, can't you discern the times? You can see the weather in the sky. Can't you discern the times? And what he was saying there had to do with their being able to discern that he was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He was preaching the coming of the kingdom. They didn't understand God's will. You see? They were looking for signs. And that was in Israel's program. That was in prophecy. Okay? The point is, if you want to understand what's going to happen in the world, you understand the, the, the greater purpose. All right? Uh, there's not going to be uh, Jews in the tribulation or people in the world in the tribulation taking tally of those events that are described in Revelation. Well, check mark, there's another one, you know. That's not happening. There's not going to be like the seventh bull party and they're there going, there's a the seventh bull right there. You know, that's not happening. Okay. What will happen in, during this tribulation time is there will be God's people who know what God is doing, and because they know what God is doing, they avoid the things that he's not, just like today. 
where you understand God's will is a sea soul saved by the preaching of the cross, the dispensation of the grace of God, right? So you understand what God is not doing today is setting up his kingdom and preaching works-based salvation. So do you have to understand the foundations of the Roman Catholic Church and apostolic authority the Roman Catholics claim to understand that they're wrong? No. You hear the Pope condemn the gospel of the grace of God and that if you preach salvation by grace through faith alone, he calls you anathema, and you say, well, that's not my gospel, so I can't be a Catholic. You see, do you have to understand the details of the Eucharist and the Mass? You don't have to. You understand automatically. I'm starting with the gospel, and he's got that wrong, so can't move on from there. It's really that simple when you know what God is doing. Okay, well, we're kingdom builders, churches say. Well, I'm not supposed to build a kingdom, so I can't go along with you in that ministry. You see, so we can understand by what God is doing, you know, what to do. It's the same thing here. If we understand the purpose of the tribulation, what God is going to be doing then, and the people who are alive at that time will know what to do. Okay? They won't have to be able to say, well, that's the Antichrist. I know because I've compared 15 verses, and that tells me that you know, Bill Gates is the Antichrist. You know? um, they, won't, they won't have to do that. Okay? You, you know how they're able to identify the Antichrist? Because he makes himself God. And they know who God is. Those who know God's will, Jesus Christ is God. Right? And that's not him. You see? That's how they'll know. And so, again, I, I wanted to, to slow down a bit today and just cover the purpose of the tribulation uh, uh, and what the prophecies say about it to give us a, a more general picture of why these things are happening. Not just what, but why. Okay? So, you're in Daniel chapter 9. And uh, we touched on this last week in a hurry at the very end of the lesson, so I want to deal with it more specifically today. Daniel 9 is a, an important chapter regarding the end of the world, the fulfillment of prophecy, because Daniel 9 is where Daniel, uh, being held in captivity, all right, that means he's outside the land of Israel. Israel has been conquered at this point, destroyed at this point, by uh, their enemies. And that has happened because God said that would happen if they broke his law. So Leviticus talks about how if you break my law, then I'll send my enemies to conquer your, your land. And that's what happened. And the enemies came. They, they, they took Israel captive. They destroyed the city and the temple. And they take them out. Okay, Daniel's in captivity. And so you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bowing down to the, 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 the statue there. Because they're in another person's land. They were servants. They were slaves, right? So Daniel 9 here, he's writing because he starts studying the prophets that God gave to Israel. And in Jeremiah, it's written that they'll be held captive for 70 years. And this will be part of their captivity, the 70-year period. Well, the 70 years, as Jeremiah said, is now over in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel 9, Daniel says this prayer to God. I've read the book of, of Jeremiah. If you look in Daniel 9 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So, see, he understood by studying the book, right? God tells Israel what he's, what he's doing there, and God tells us what he's doing today. He, he, after he read and understood this, he prayed to God and confessed the sins of the nation. Because he knew in Leviticus 26, verse 40, when God said that if my people will confess their sins, I'm paraphrasing here, but you can go back and look at it for yourself. If they confess their sins, then God will remember the promises he made to the fathers. Okay, and so if you ever wonder where to put 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is just to forgive your sins, that is a quote from Leviticus that is a, a part of prophecy where Israel would confess their sins and God is just to forgive them because the promises he made with them. Daniel 9, he does just that. He confesses the sin of Israel and says, I know why we're in captivity. Jeremiah wrote about it. You know, Ezekiel wrote about it. I know why we're here. I confess in these sins. Are, you know, we've, we've rejected you. We've disobeyed you. And then he prays that he would fulfill that promise that he made, that he would bring them back in 70 years and bring them back to the land. Okay. Well, after waiting a little bit, um, his prayer gets answered. And if you've read Daniel 9, you know the angel comes back and he appears to Daniel, knocks him down on his face, and starts telling him what God sent him to explain, which is this prophecy of how God is going to fulfill everything God has promised to Israel. Everything. Not just go back to the land, but everything. Fulfilling the land and the kingdom and righteousness and everything else. And we started reading in Daniel 9, verse 24, where the angel here is explaining this prophecy and says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's Jerusalem and Israel, right? So immediately we know this is not talking about the church. 
And 70 weeks is a time reference, which is so important, because we're talking about end times, and as we're talking uh, about Daniel here, and he wants to know when things will happen, this is helpful. When God gives you a date, you take it. When God doesn't give you a date, you're not going to have a date, folks. <laughs> But when God gives you one, wow, that's helpful. So in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon Israel and upon Jerusalem. And what's going to happen after 70 weeks? We list here six things that are going to happen. Okay, 70 weeks are determined to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. And we're going to pause there because these six things that are listed are divided into two. One, the first three things that are listed have to do with sins and punishment and judgment. The second three things have to do with righteousness and peace and the end of things. So, so read these once again in verse 24. It says, to finish the transgression. Okay, Israel had sinned against God. There was punishment coming. Seventy weeks to finish the transgression. To make an end of sins. Okay, the sins have been dealt with. No more sins. No more payment for sins. That's what he's talking about. Seventy weeks to determine the end of this. And the third thing, to make reconciliation for iniquity to make things right, to restore the things that have resulted because sin and iniquity has entered the world. All right. The second three things there that are mentioned in Daniel 9, verse 24, have to do with bringing in everlasting righteousness. Notice the word everlasting. Okay. Righteousness to the earth, to seal up the vision and the prophecy is what he says, and to anoint the most holy. So you see the first three things there have to do with sin and wrapping up the punishment and the things needed to deal with sin. The second three th things have to do with bringing in that righteousness. Okay, The thing which God has purposed for the world since the world began. That the world would be in obedience to him and so submit to him and his righteousness would reign on the earth and everything else. So everlasting righteousness. Notice the second thing in the list. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. Okay, Daniel is told here that 70 weeks are determined for prophecy to be fulfilled. Like the vision, the prophecy that Daniel's been given. You can go back and study Daniel 2, 7, 8, or 7 and 10 there and, and see the visions he's been given about uh, the empires and the Messiah coming back. And it says 70 weeks, that's all going to be over. The vision, the prophecy is going to be done. Okay. Look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Daniel didn't have the prophet of the book of Revelation when he wrote Daniel 9. There were things he didn't know. Revelation's a book that reveals things. In Revelation 10, we see in verse 7, an interesting verse. It says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as yet declared to his servants, the prophets. See that? Finished. Revelation is a book that talks about the end and the finishing of things. In Revelation 20 here speaks about when the things that were prophesied are going to be done. Now it calls it here the mystery of God. I need to point out, since we understand the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ and the mystery of God are not the same. You know that from the verse when it says that he hath declared this to the servants, his servants, the prophets. The mystery of Christ was not declared to the prophets. Okay, but the mystery of God, which he had spoken since the world began, the prophets spoke about, and in the end of these things. By the way, that mystery of God is, is that same question that keeps coming up. Daniel asked in Daniel 12, he says, what will the end of these things be? Matthew 24, the disciples ask, what will be the sign of these times, right? Revelation 10, verse 7. Well, it's going to be done. By this point, Revelation 10, 7, uh, what the prophets had declared is finished. That's interesting, too, because it's right in the middle of the book. But that's what Daniel 9.24 says. The seal of the vision and the prophecy. Okay. Um, in Daniel 9.24, you see there again, it says, and to anoint the most holy. And so we have anointing of the holy. Now, people who do not, how do I say this? People who are not dispensational, who, who do not think the Bible can be taken literally and do not study prophecy literally, Read Daniel 9.24 and the verses that follow and spiritualize the verses and say all of these refer to Christ. Daniel 9.24 and say all these things are fulfilled in the cross. And the cross here finished transgression because he died for sins. And he made an end of sins because he nailed him to the cross. And he made reconciliation for iniquity because as Paul says, we're the ministers of reconciliation. Okay. Hopefully you can see immediately the error in this type of view because what Paul says, us being the ministers of reconciliation, wasn't well, that a mystery? then why is it spoken of in Daniel 9.24? Right? That's an issue. And besides that, for 2,000 years, what's been going on on the earth? Do we see an end of sins, an end of transgressions? Do we see reconciliation on the planet? We don't. Okay? We live in a sin-cursed world. Galatians 1 says a present evil world. We've got a problem on the earth. 
Now, certainly, God is offering salvation and reconciliation through the preaching of the cross, according to the revelation of the mystery. And he's offering this to the world. And we can have an end of sins, but does the world have an end of sins? No. Okay, and this is a failure of, of some folks who, who, who read Paul, and they think what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says that we either preach reconciliation is that there's no sins anymore at all because Christ took them all. This leads to universalism, folks, that all men are saved. That's not the truth. The only people whose sins are forgiven today are people who trust Christ's payment for sins, according to the gospel of Christ. The rest of the world, if they haven't trusted Christ, they've got sins that have to be dealt with, you see. So the end of sins is not yet. Christ made the payment, but it's not applied until you put your faith in the gospel of Christ today. So there's a lot of people in the world who do have judgment coming for whom Christ did, Christ's judgment, Christ's payment is not applied to them. Okay? That's why we preach the gospel. We want to lessen that number, you see. So we preach the gospel, they put their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their sins are forgiven. All right? People who think that God has nothing else to do with sins anymore and that Christ took care of all of that, they really have to deny all the prophetic passages we read in Revelation in the future. Paul himself talks about it, where Christ will return and judge those who reject the gospel. Right? What about the great white throne judgment? Well, they say, well, that's not for sins. What about 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where Paul says Christ will return in judgment and fire, taking vengeance on them? Well, that can't be vengeance for sins. Really? And what is it vengeance for, if not sins? Okay? And so you see, there's an issue when people say, well, Christ is the end of all those things at the cross back there. Okay? Yes, Christ made a payment at the cross, and his blood is able to save all men. Right? But it was not applied to all men at the cross. There's a difference between that provision and its application. Right? And so we need to make that distinction. Daniel 9.24, though, the prophecy here is that we're going to make an end of sins, to finish transgression, to bring in reconciliation of iniquity. This is like a world prophecy here, okay, to the whole nation of Israel, upon your people, Israel, and the city. Does Israel have reconciliation of iniquity? Is Israel's sins done? They don't even receive Christ. They don't even put their faith in the gospel of Christ, right? So we got an issue here. And what about everlasting righteousness? What about uh, sealing up the vision of the prophecy? I mentioned last week, there are folks who say that the prophecies have all been fulfilled 2,000 years ago with Christ on the cross. So everything in Revelation, everything in Daniel, all the prophets spoke about, they were speaking about what happened 2,000 years ago. Okay. Well, again, you really have to spiritualize a lot of the information back there. Okay. To, see, to, to say in Revelation, we covered last week what, what the, the tribulation was and how there were billions of people who were going to die and how those, those, those uh, visions in the, in the heavens and the, the wrath that comes down from God to say that happened 2,000 years ago on one city on the planet, that, that's really distorting the natural reading of the scripture. And they confess it's an allegory. They confess it's a spiritualizing. Okay, so we, we read the Bible literally and so thus we see it can't naturally happen that way. There are still prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Okay. To seal the vision of the prophecy. Doesn't Paul himself say there's still a return of the Lord? Don't we think Christ is going to return to bring judgment and war and set up his kingdom on the earth, or don't we? You see, if it has already happened, as the covenant theologians say, that we're living in the kingdom now, you know, then there's nothing here to read. It's all done. But if the kingdom on earth is not here, then Daniel 9 24 is not yet fulfilled. The 70 weeks that were determined are not yet finished. You see the option? If we're living in the kingdom now, then they can say, you know, 924 is all in the past. If we're not living in the kingdom now and it's still future, then 70 weeks aren't done. As the angel said, there's 70 weeks determined upon thy people to finish all of these things, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal the vision of the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. So that was Christ, they say. He's the holy one. Yes, he is. But has he returned as king of the earth? There are people who claim today that Christ is sitting on the throne as sovereign over the planet, as king of the world, to which we look around and say, well, how good of a job is he really doing? I mean, where on the earth is he actually reigning with his rod of iron? Because we can't even get a bill passed in Congress. You know, I mean, what's going on? Well, I think that the clear conclusion would be that Daniel 9.24 is simply not fulfilled yet. God is not done with the earth. Okay, there's something future yet. Daniel 9.25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So he mentions 70 weeks 
being the determination of all things. And then he goes on to describe there's three parts to these 70 weeks. There's the, what's he say there, the seven weeks, and then there's the 62 weeks, and then if you add one more, you get 70, right? So there's a seven weeks, a 62 weeks, and a one week. And uh, what this is going to turn out to be is not 70 weeks of days, but 70 weeks of years. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, one way we know that is because of the Messiah, the Prince there. It says there'll be 69 weeks until the Messiah, the Prince, is cut off. Right? Nothing happened 69 weeks of days after, after this happened, after Ezra and Nehemiah. Nothing happened then. There was nothing historically significant, nothing recorded in the Bible significant. What we do know is that in the Bible, there are prophecies that have to do with weeks of years. And so having the two options, we say, well, if we're looking for the temple to be rebuilt, if we're looking for the city to be rebuilt, you know what happened in seven weeks times seven years is 49 years. What happened 49 years after the prophecy began is the city and the temple was rebuilt. Oh, and we can see that in the Bible. So now we have a way to identify and interpret this prophecy right here. So you, the prophecy says in verse 25 that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That's the beginning, right? From that commandment is when it begins. You can read in Azariah and Nehemiah that after Daniel wrote this prophecy, Ezra comes back and he starts rebuilding the temple. Okay. You see uh, in Nehemiah that Nehemiah starts going back and rebuilds the city, which is what verse 25 says. The commandment to rebuild the city, the Jerusalem. And Nehemiah 2 explains the rebuilding of the walls and rebuilding of the, the, the houses and things like that. And that happened in troubled times, is what Daniel says. And 49 years later, after that commandment began, they were done with it. Okay. The verse 25 says there'll be 60 in two weeks plus the seven until Messiah be cut off. And so 60 and two times seven. I know we're all mathematicians, right? 434 years. There's a total of 400, what is that, 83 years? Is that why I wrote on the board here? Important 83 years from the beginning of this prophecy until Messiah is cut off. And lo and behold, what we have is 483 years from when the commandment began in Nehemiah chapter 2 to Jesus Christ, 483 years. Okay. I remember asking a, a Jew I was talking to one time who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, what's he do with this verse right here in line verse 25 that says after 483 years the Messiah are going to come? If you make it literal weekdays, it's even shorter than that. If you make it weak years, it's going to be at least 490 years before 70 years is done, 70 weeks is done. Either way, it can't be 2015, right? We're thousands of years removed from that. So that verse says the Messiah is going to come sometime in the past from where we're at now. So let's look back in the past. Who's that guy? Who's the best options for that guy, right? Read Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is a good passage to show unbelieving Jews because Isaiah 53 talks about Jesus Christ. talks about the coming Messiah. And now he will come to his people, Israel, and his people will reject him, and he'll die because of some innocent, uh, something he didn't do, and he'll die for the sins of his people, right? And that's what Isaiah 53 describes. And if you look back in history to see if there's anyone that seems like it matches Isaiah 53, anyone who, who's awake in the world realizes that sounds like Jesus. Not just because Christians preach it, because the, the words say it. I mean, just read the words. Don't forget about the Christian preachers. Read the Isaiah 53 and tell me that's not Jesus. Okay. Especially when you have a Christian church or people who claim to be Christians across the world proclaiming this man who died innocently at the hands of Israel. That's why skeptics today try to, try to uh, say that Christ never existed. Right? He never even existed in history, which is just a foolish claim to make. Even unbelieving Jews like Josephus understood that he, he, he existed and wrote it in his history. But Daniel 9, verse 25, getting back to the prophecy here, we see that 483 years after this prophecy began, Daniel gave the prophecy around 500 B.C. Okay, the commandment to restore the temple was about 450 B.C., thereabouts. In 450 B.C., uh, you move forward here. Of course, you've got to count Jewish years in there, and so if you have questions about that, we can talk about it later. But it's not a math lesson here. It, it leads to Messiah the Prince. The prophecy says the Messiah the Prince shall be... 62 and 7 weeks. Verse 26 says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And so we have this prophecy about the death of Christ, which is significant. It says here, not only will the Messiah come, but the Messiah will die. 
So when Messiah comes and he preaches the kingdom is at hand and the Jews there who believe him say, are you going to restore the kingdom now? And, and you know, is the kingdom going to come? You know what they didn't understand? Daniel 9 verse 26. What was one of the things that Jesus opened up their eyes to understand was that I had to die according to the scriptures. To fulfill the prophets, I had to die. Daniel 9 26 is one of those passages where it says the Messiah will come 483 years after the beginning of the prophecy and he'll be cut off. Okay, he'll die. So he shows them this and they go, wow, we didn't know that before, but now you showed us, that makes a lot of sense. You definitely had to die. Not only Daniel 9, but Isaiah 53 and Psalm 2 and other passages talk about the, the death of the Messiah. And so this is just one of them. Um, it, so Daniel 9, 25 deals with the Messiah come. Now look at Zechariah chapter 9. Keep your hand on Daniel 9, we'll come back here. Look at Zechariah 9. If you know where the book of Matthew is, you turn left a few pages and you get to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9. The prophecy says there will be 69 of Daniel's weeks before the Messiah comes, the Messiah the Prince comes. Do the calculations and you can figure out the chronology of that. But Zechariah chapter 9, in verse 9. This verse is significant because it tells us when the king of Israel rides into Jerusalem, Messiah the Prince, the king of Israel, right? And we know that's what it's talking about because in Matthew 21, it references this verse right here. Okay, so this is a biblical cross-reference. There's no interpretation needed. You can look at a Bible verse and say, that's referencing that verse, since that's what happened. Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Right? So he's riding on a donkey, right? And he has salvation. Is he coming in Jerusalem here to judge and to war? No, that's what the verse says. He's coming of salvation. He's coming as a just one, right? Now look at Matthew 21. You say, I wonder when that's fulfilled. And if all you had was Zechariah 9, verse 9, you may not know when, because in verse 10 in Zechariah 9, it says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 9, 9 says he's going to ride in Jerusalem on this colt. And then verse 10 says, and have dominion over all the world. So if you're reading a Zechariah as a Jew, you're going, yep, that's the coming kingdom, Right? What did we learn a couple weeks ago? That was one thing that Israel had to learn, is that Christ was going to come twice, not just once. And we see in prophecy many times that a verse right next to each other, one talks about his first coming, another talks about his second coming. That's what you see in Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, 9 talks about his first coming and salvation. Zechariah 9, 10 talks about his second coming, to have dominion. But Matthew 21 is how I can make that statement and how you can understand it. Because here, when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, this is Jesus' ministry to Israel. They were coming to Bethphage and unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go unto the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto thee, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by his prophet, saying, Tell you the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king comes unto thee, meek for sit and sitting upon an ass. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Matthew 21, verse 5, quotes Zechariah 9, verse 9, and says, this is what happened when Jesus told us to go get that cult. Right. And you know what Sunday this is. You know, I, I revealed it. You know what day this is? Because the church always, always practices this day, right? Palm Sunday, where Jesus rides in Jerusalem, and they got the palm leaves, and the, what are they singing? Hosanna. Blessed be my rock. Right. You sing the song, it's in Psalms, when he rides into Jerusalem. In Matthew 21, verse uh, 8, very great multitude, um, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. It's like Ryan 9. It says, Your king rides in Jerusalem. Right? And here they're praising him. This is one week before they crucify him. So you've heard the story before. One week later, these same people crying Hosanna are saying crucify him. Right? And you have that change of events. 
But you see the fulfillment of prophecy here in Zechariah 9, where Daniel 9 says there'll be 69 Daniel weeks, 483 years until the Messiah, the Prince. And we see Zechariah 9 say the king will ride in Jerusalem. Matthew, Matthew 21, he rides in Jerusalem to fulfill the prophecy. But Daniel 9 says when that Messiah, the Prince, comes, he'll be cut off. So how is it Zechariah 9 can be fulfilled that he rides in the king of Israel and also be cut off? Well, that's what you get in Matthew 21. He rides in Jerusalem. They cry Hosanna one week later. He crucify him. Right? Everything that happens in Matthew is a fulfillment of prophecy, Daniel being one of those prophecies. Okay? You see uh, in verse uh, uh, 12 and after then, uh, Jesus goes in there. He starts turning, overturning the tables and things like that in the temple. Okay? That is not him having dominion over, from sea to shining sea. It's not him having dominion across the world. They crucified him. His dominion never came. Okay, that, that's the question we need to be asking is when does that happen? Of course, he comes twi twice. Look back at Daniel chapter 9 in verse uh, 26. Let's finish the verse here, the prophecy. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's six, uh, 62 weeks plus the seven weeks it took to build the temple. That's 69 of Daniel's weeks. Right? There's one week left. For Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled. That's why we called that tribulation Daniel's 70th week. It's that last week that's determined before the end of all sins and the establishment of everlasting righteousness, the kingdom. Okay? So Daniel 9 26 says, The Messiah should be cut off, but not for himself. He's not going to die from natural causes. He's not going to have anything to his name. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, which is fascinating. Because didn't the beginning of this prophecy begin with the rebuilding of the city and the sanctuary? And now we've got someone that's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary? Hmm. Fascinating. Okay, so Daniel 9, 26, the people of the prince that shall come. I don't want to get into details of the prince or the Antichrist. We'll probably deal with that in the future. But this is what this is talking about here. The people of the prince that shall come, that world empire that will be at the time of these days, Okay, which, uh, Daniel talks about the revived Roman Empire, right? The people of that prince will destroy the city and sanctuary. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Okay, knocked down, right? Jesus talked about that in Luke 21. And a lot of people say, well, that was the end of Daniel's prophecy right there. That was the beginning of everlasting righteousness. I don't think so. Okay, that was the beginning of the end as far as the kingdom come. Yeah, I don't think so. Well, they say that was the greatest tribulation that had ever occurred in Jerusalem. Yeah, in Jerusalem, right? And by the way, what's the purpose of this tribulation? Because that will really help us understand the interpretation of it. If we're just trying to find some event in history that's going to match that verse, then yeah, we can pick this or that event. But what's the whole purpose of this tribulation and kingdom? What's the point of it? In 924, it says it's to establish everlasting righteousness, to make an end of all sins. <clears throat> okay, the people of the prince that shall come so shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Desolations, desecrations, sins will happen. Okay? If Christ put an end to all sins, then why is there desolations, verse 26, after the Messiah is cut off? Hmm? It's not, it's not finished yet. The 70th week is not done yet. That's why. In verse 27, He, the prince uh, the, uh, that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's your final week. Your one week. Uh, will confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Question, what sacrifice? Didn't, didn't the sanctuary just get destroyed? Right? So what, what sacrifice? Doesn't the verse imply, now that we know that it was destroyed <laughs> some 1900 years ago, that there has to be a rebuilding of the sacrificial system for that to occur? Right? When Jesus came in Matthew 24 and he tells his disciples and they ask, when will these things be? And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, Daniel 9 verse 27 here, when you see that happen, flee to the mountains. Right? And Dan in Matthew 24 when Jesus said that, there was a temple there. Right? In Daniel 9 27, it, there needs to be a temple here for this sacrifice to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. You know what consummation means? I know we've got a lot of big words here that we don't use every day, but consummation simply means the finishing of all things. It's the end, the completion, the consummate, the, the end, when things are wrapped up, right? So it says, there'll be overspreading of abominations, 
and he shall make it desolate, and he shall desecrate it, even until the consummation, the end of all things. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Well, what determined? Judgment, right? Punishment against those who desolate God's land, God's temple, God's people, right? Is the holy anointed at this time, right? Was the everlasting righteousness happening here when God has promised to, to bring judgment upon those who desolate God's people? Right? It hasn't happened yet. Daniel's 70th week is still in yet future. But that leads us to a conclusion, as we've just gone through the prophecy here, just briefly, and I know that there's been lots of books written about this and lots of people talking about it. I don't claim to clear up all the questions about it. What I intend to do is just to show the purpose of the coming 70th week, that coming time of tribulation in the kingdom. Okay, what is left to finish in this prophecy is judgment from God and the establishment of his kingdom. That's what's left. We've had the temple rebuilt in 49 years from when the prophecy started. We've had the Messiah cut off. We've even had the temple in the city destroyed. Right? What we haven't had happen is the, the, what was determined upon his people in the city, the judgment, and that everlasting righteousness. We haven't had these things occur. Okay, they haven't happened yet. Daniel's 70th week is yet to, uh, yet to happen. Now let's look at something else. Look at Revelation chapter 4. I need to make my case a little bit further that the purpose of the tribulation and the coming kingdom in the future is to accomplish what God had in his mind purpose since the world began to finish all the punishment and judgment for sins, to end the transgressions and the sins, and to bring in righteousness and salvation to the earth. We're going to go to Revelation 4 to talk about this. Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is a vision that John sees of Jesus Christ, and he's given information to send in letters to seven churches. After that, you don't read the word church in Revelation after verse, chapter 3 to the last few verses. The, the word church doesn't appear when Revelation starts talking about this tribulation time. It doesn't appear there. Revelation 4.1, some people uh, who are dispensationalists like to say the rapture happens here, but there's nothing in the verse that indicates this. Okay, the, the church is not found in the book of Revelation. What we have in the book of Revelation is a description of the fulfillment, the consummation of God's prophetic purpose. It says in verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That's where Tim LaHaye puts the rapture. You didn't see it? It's in between the words. It's there. When John goes up to heaven, that's when they make you go up to heaven, not knowing, of course, that John is one of the 12 apostles to Israel, not part of the church, the body of Christ today. Neither here nor there. We're not talking about the rapture today. We're talking about Revelation 4. In verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. Gay pride, right? No, rainbows in the Bible are God's symbol, right? He set the rainbow in the sky in Genesis chapter 9 after he, he promised salvation not to flood the world again. And we see a rainbow over the throne of God in Revelation 4 verse 3. A rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, right? Green. And so this is the, the, the image, the vision that John sees of the throne of God. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats they saw four and twenty elders. And I know you're all asking, who are those guys? And I'm going to say, it's not for you to know. I don't know. People, people speculate, there's not a verse that tells us exactly who they are. That's not the point of today's lesson. That's what I'm saying. People get distracted in these details, and they forget the big picture. What's going on here? Four and twenty elders, who are those guys? Okay, it doesn't tell us. Let's move on, right? What, what's, what's happening here? What's going on? And they're up there in this throne room. There's 24 elders. There's other creatures there. And there's beasts all around. There's a crystal sea and everything else. And what's going on is it starts in chapter 5. They start praising God, uh, whom honor and glory, and he was worthy of all glory, honor, and power. In Revelation 4, verse 11. Revelation 5, verse 1 says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? That's a strange book. I mean, who's worthy to open the, the book, the seals of the book? You have books on your bookshelf and people go up and open them all the time. Why do you have to be worthy to open this book? Why is that? This is not your normal book, folks. This is not your Sunday newspaper. You don't have to be worthy to read that. 
you don't have to be worthy to open your Bible. Okay, now some people spiritualize that and say, well, this is a holy Bible, right? And so you shouldn't touch this with unclean hands. But God has given grace to sinners today. You can't be saved without opening the Bible, without hearing the message in it, right? So what is this book in Revelation 5, which is sealed, and they don't know the contents, and you have to be worthy to open the book? This is going to be significant to understand what's going on here. Because you want to skip over this chapter and go to the seals and the trumpets and the vials and look at all the exciting stuff happening. Movies are made out of that stuff. You know, forget the sealed book, but that has everything to do with it. Because what is the purpose of all this? What is God trying to accomplish? What is God doing? And this is where God is sitting on the throne. And he's got a book. And it's sealed. And apparently, he can't even open it. What? God can't open it? I mean, surely God can do all things, right? There's something about this book. We're going to find out what it is. And it has something to do with the purpose of the tribulation, okay? Revelation 5, verse 3 says, No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Wow. Cry baby John the Apostle right here. I mean, what's the big deal, John? Why are you weeping? Because you can't open this book. Apparently, there, there's something they know about this. There's something they know that in order to for things to be complete, for the consummation to happen, for the end of all things to occur, this book has to be opened. Why? Why can't he just, you know, come back and destroy everybody and set up his kingdom? Why does this book have to be opened for? Right? Well, the book concerns God's purpose for the earth. We know that because as we read the rest of the book of Revelation, as the seals are broken, what happens? Things happen on the earth, right? And what happens after the seal is unscrolled? Christ comes back to the earth. And Christ comes back and reclaims the earth. Okay? This book concerns God's purpose for the earth. What does that say about the church today? That, that book doesn't talk about us. That's not, that book's not for us. Okay? We have a promise now, and we understand the manifold wisdom of God, Ephesians 3, 9, and 10, the things in heavenly places. We don't have a book with seals on it talking about your destiny. You have a position right now, complete in Christ in heavenly places. What a glorious thing that is. Amen. There's nothing you have to wait for. Israel, they had prophecies that needed to be fulfilled. They had signs that needed to occur. They had tribulation and kingdom, and there's a book that's keeping them from getting there. They've got things that got to happen. Okay, there's nothing that has to happen for you to claim salvation and eternal glory with God, Romans 8.18, because of what Christ did for you and gave you freely through the preaching of the gospel, okay? This book concerns God's purpose for the earth. Look at Genesis 14, 22. Let's get some background here. We need to understand, first of all, that if you were a Jew, which you may not be, but if you were a Jew 2,000 years ago, if you were a Jew who understood Israel's laws, as we'll see here in a moment, if you were John the Apostle, then you may understand what's going on with this book. And that may be why he's weeping over it. Genesis 14, 22, we learn something about God, and that is that he is the possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis 14, 22, of course, we know in Genesis 1, he created the heaven and the earth. That should be the first indicator that all things are his. But Genesis 14, 22, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Right? Abraham knows this. He knows the God who possesses all things. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5. Exodus 19, verse 5. This is the chapter which is located on Mount Sinai, which God speaks to Moses, to his people, the sons of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he tells them his purpose for them, which is this covenant of the law. And if they agree to do so, if they keep it, he'll bless them. If they break it, he'll curse them. Exodus 19, verse 5, he says, If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Wow. It's kind of possessive, isn't he? God says, all the earth is mine. He's possessor of heaven and earth. Now we just see all the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we've studied before in the, in the dispensational chart. What happens after we learn he created the heaven and the earth? Well, he talks about the earth for many, many chapters in the Bible. He doesn't even talk about who goes to heaven until the Apostle Paul when he talks about giving you a seat in heaven. That's all about the earth. In Exodus 19, here to his earthly people, to a nation on the earth, who he promises a land on the earth. He says, all the earth is mine, and so I promise to give it to you above all the nations of the earth. Okay? 
Let's look at Leviticus. Well, look at Genesis 12. God has a right to the planet. We know because he created it. We know because he's the possessor of it. We know because he made a covenant with Israel that he would give it to them. Okay. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, he calls Abraham out. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. If the earth is the Lord's, he has the right to give it to whom he wants. And he told Abram, I will give it to you. It's a promise. There's no conditions here. I will give it to you. It's not here. This is before the law. It's not if you obey my commandments. It's I'm going to give it to you. Okay, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 15. He says, For the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. God owns the land. He gave it in trust to man, to the first man. He said, have dominion on the earth. And what did Adam do? Sinned. Started serving Satan. The man he entrusted with the, the land started serving the devil. He calls Abram out and says, I will give you this land. Right? And it's the same story over and over again. What happens when God gives things to people? Well, they mess it up. Right? It's God's land, but he entrusts it to other people. And here he tells Abraham, I will give you this land. Exodus 19 makes a covenant with them. If you keep my law, I will give you this land. See, why did God add that law? I mean, he already made a promise, right? Well, there's many reasons why he added the law. We know one, of course, is that the law brings the knowledge of sin. So he's trying to get through man's dense skull that you're a sinner. I'm the Savior, right? So the law was going to show they're the sinner part. That's what it should have done. But there's another reason why he gave the law to Israel, why he gave the law in the Bible. And that's because the law is going to explain God's right. Think about that for a second. The law is God's righteousness, right? The law is the, the declaration of the righteousness of, of God. If men keep these commandments, they'll be righteous, Deuteronomy 6.25 says. Of course they can't, but if they did, they would be, right? The law declares God's right, not just in his righteous works, but also in his right to things. His right to judge, for example, right? He is the judge of all things. He created humankind, but, you know, we tend to rebel against that and say, God has no right to judge me. Oh, yes? Well, let's go through some of the law, and we'll see what right he has to judge you. He's holy, righteous, and good. You are a guilty sinner. That's his right. The law condemns you, right? The law condemned Israel. What right does God have to rule the planet? Well, he made it, yes, but we tend to resist that and say, well, you know, you know, what's that? Uh, inhabitors' rights or something? Squatters' rights? We're here. You know, you're not. You know, it's my land. Really? Well, the law explains God's right to it. Okay, and it explains that it's mine. I gave it to you. And even if you don't use it to my intended purpose, I can redeem it back. Right? And look at Leviticus chapter 25. You've heard of the law of the kinsman redeemer? You should, because that's what the Book of Ruth's about. And I know every lady here is going to study on the Book of Ruth. That's what women do. They study the Book of Ruth. <laughs> Lucas 25 talks about the law of the kinsman redeemer. Uh, the kinsman redeemer applies to Ruth because when Ruth came back, you know, and she married Boaz and that sort of business, that uh, Ruth's husband, who had died, had land in Israel, had a right to that. And Boaz was the next in line, so, or he was the second in line. And so there was a, a right issue, a legal right issue, who can marry this woman and assume the property that was her right. And um, they had to go through the law there, and Boaz took a guy's shoe off and threw it, and it was kind of confusing. That's what the law said. This is, it had to do with a legal ceremony of Boaz redeeming the land that was not his because of his marriage to, to Ruth and because of his taking the right of a kinsman redeemer. Okay. Leviticus 25 explains this regarding the land, specifically. Leviticus 25, you see in verse 23. The land shall not be sold forever. How is that for all you real estate moguls, right? Uh, this was God explaining to Israel that they would, were not supposed to sell their land. Remember, God gave the land to Israel. At this time, they're in the land, okay? He's divided up the land among the 12 tribes, and they were not to sell it. It was against the law. They, they were supposed to keep it. It was supposed to be there forever. It was their land, right? Obviously, th there was a problem, <laughs> okay? But they're not to sell the land, for the land is mine, for ye were strangers and sojourners with me. But this is my land. I've given it to you. You're not to sell it. It's to you, okay? But look what he goes on to say. 
as the law often does, it tells you not to do something, and then it says, and if you do it. Because <laughs> he knows what men are going to do. They're going to break the law. In verse 24, in all the land of your possession, he shall grant a redemption for the land. So if someone were to happen to sell the land or to lose the land somehow, I mean, they're, they're gambling or whatever happens, you know, and they lose the land. It says there should be a law of redemption. That is, the law can be redeemed back, can be purchased back. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. This is the law of the kinsman redeemer. Okay. Because the, the land was to stay with Israel. They weren't to sell it. And even in Israel, the land was to stay with each tribe. You couldn't sell the land to another tribe. So each tribe had their allotment, and it was to stay in that tribe. So you shouldn't sell it to another tribe. If someone was poor and because they needed money, they sold the possession, there had to be a clause to redeem the land by a kinsman. Someone of the original tribe, of the person who owned it, they could come and say, well, I'm of their tribe and I have the money. I'm going to buy back this land. And there was supposed to be a clause in every uh, land deal that that could happen. Okay, the kinsman redeemer. Of course, for that to occur, there had to be someone who was a relative of the person who originally owned the land and they had to have the payment to pay for it, right? And surely you've heard messages preached about Jesus Christ being the ultimate kinsman redeemer because God manifest in the flesh became a relative to us, like us, in a human flesh. And he paid the price needed to pay for our sin, right? So he is the ultimate kinsman redeemer of humanity. Amen and amen. Yes, that's true. Okay, that's what he did here. He redeemed humanity. But not just humanity, but the earth. What did he have on his, in his head? A crown of thorns, right? He came to redeem the earth. So specifically for Israel, we know, of course, today, salvation is offered freely to all, but specifically to Israel, he came to redeem that which he promised to them, their salvation on the earth, their land, you see, and the earth. And so he came to redeem that. Leviticus 25, 26 says, if, uh, if the man have none to redeem it, and he himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. But if he not be able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. And so, again, he's talking about here the price and what price you could sell it for and that sort of thing. It had to be the price paid for the debt that was owed. It couldn't just be any price. It had to, be the, it had to pay for the debt that was owed. Right. So thus, again, you have Christ's uh, sinless blood being able to pay the price for what was owed for sinners and the blood needed for them. The wages of sin is death. Christ had to die. You see, so you have the, in the law here a description of what the kinsman redeemer had to do in order to redeem the land, redeem his people. You see, what does that have to do with Revelation? What does that have to do with the seal? Well, let's look at Jeremiah 32. Because there's a part of the transaction here that we're missing in Jeremiah 32, where when the kinsman redeemer came and they made the payment for the land, they would draw up documents to, to declare who owned it. You know, mortgage contract, right? And they would make two documents. One would be unsealed for everyone to know who now redeemed this land. And the other one would be sealed. So that in case someone meddled with the open document, they could always go back and open the sealed document to see who the rightful owner was. Okay, in Jeremiah 32, we see an example of this, where Jeremiah is in prison. Okay, he is in prison because of his prophesying for God. And Jeremiah 32, down in verse 8 is where I want to start. When he's in prison, uh, here we have uh, the Babylonians are coming, and they are taking over Israel, and so people are selling their property. Okay, this is what happened recently, and every time the world ends, people say, well, things are going to get destroyed, so sell your property. You know, well, this is what's happening in, in Israel. Okay, the, 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 other, the enemies are coming into the land, and they're destroying things. And so people in the land, they're getting out. Well, the getting's good. Well, Jeremiah's in prison. So how's that? He's in prison, but one of his relatives comes to him, his uncle, and says, I got some land, and you're the kinsman. You're the next in line. You have the right to buy this. Why don't you buy it from me? Jeremiah says, okay. Why does he buy it? He's going to say he buys it because he knows that God says they'll come back to the land. And when he comes back to the land, now Jeremiah's got some, Jeremiah's got some land. Right? Anyway, Jeremiah 32, verse 8. Hamamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the core of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hamamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Ananoth, and weighed him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it. What evidence? The evidence that I bought it was silver, 
uh, it's my land now, I sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money and the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and the custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence to Baruch, the son of Neriah, and told him to hide it somewhere. You know, make, make sure you keep this safe. I just bought some land. I've got two documents. One is sealed and one is not, so that, you, that we know wh whose it is. Take this and put it away. Put it in the, the lockbox, right? Because he knows, as we'll say in a bit here, that when he comes back, God's going to bring him back to the land. He's going to have the rightful documents of ownership for that land, okay? Hopefully you're seeing a picture come full circle here a little bit. When we see in Revelation chapter 5, we see a book in the hand of God when he's preparing to operate, to reclaim his land on the earth, his possession of the earth, and there's a document with seals on it. The seals that were made on it were the seal of the kinsman redeemer, and nobody can open that book but the kinsman redeemer, who not only was a kinsman of the people who owned the land originally, but was the redeemer who paid the price. In Revelation 5 then, Who's worthy to open this book? And they'll stand ground, we're not the kinsman redeemer. And who is worthy? Revelation chapter 5. Let's look at Revelation 5. You say, why are you telling us this Jewish legal lesson? Because people don't understand this. And they're just looking for blood moons. Like, really, folks? There was a law, you know, and God dealt with Israel accordingly. And he dealt with the land accordingly. And he wrapped up his possession of the earth in this law so that you can go back and read how he's going to claim it. It's not just willy-nilly. God doesn't do it by force. I'm the bully in town, you know. There's a legal right he has, and he proves it. God is a God of justice, you see. In Revelation chapter 5, uh, we, last, we left John, he was weeping because no one was worthy to open the book. Verse 5, then one of the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, wh why is he opening the book here? We know who the tribe, lion of the tribe of Judah is. We know who the root of David is. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah, right? Which we've already seen prophesied. But why is he just now opening the book? I mean, why didn't he do it back here? Right? Because wh you open that book that's sealed to claim your right to ownership. If your right is disputed, where do you go? The sealed book, right? If someone else is squatting in your land, they go, this is mine. And the owner goes, nope, I bought it. Well, how do you settle that claim? In the court. Where's the sealed document, right? Sure, you can corrupt an open document, but one that's sealed with the seal of the kinsman redeemer that only the kinsman redeemer can open. When you open it up, then we'll see what was originally written because it was sealed. When it was purchased, it was sealed, right? And when Christ comes back, thousands of years from when he purchased it, apparently, with his blood, he's going to say, well, it's time to open this document. And he starts cracking these seals open, and things start happening in the earth in order for him to reclaim his title to the land. Okay, what does this have to do with our study of prophecy? You need to understand why these things are happening in the tribulation of the kingdom. They're happening because God is reclaiming his right to the earth, and that is not what God is doing today, right? Isn't he sending his ambassadors today to preach the gospel of the mystery to all the world? He's not coming back to the earth to reclaim it. But when he starts breaking these seals, he is saying, I'm going to claim my right to the earth, which means he's done preaching grace to the world. You see? So now when you realize that, it matters less, all the, the little details, which we can also study and take all of our time with. But now we know the greater picture is that God is trying to reclaim the earth. Right? That's why he's opening those seals. Okay? In Revelation 5, then, he starts doing that. He's loosing the seals. And they start singing a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, in verse 9, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, just like the law said. Right? Kinsman, redeemer. Now thy blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. By the way, that kings and priests, that's the same thing you find in Exodus 19, verse 5. If you obey my commandments, I'll make you kings and priests, a peculiar nation above all the nations of the earth, because all the earth is mine. Right? It's the same language you find in Israel all throughout. And so you start seeing in chapter 6, these seals being opened. God's operation beginning to reclaim his land. Right? Very different than what God is doing today. Okay? <sighs> Am I out of time again? I didn't get to this last week. Yeah. Look at Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11. What you start seeing as the Lord starts unsealing these things is that the events that happen during this tribulation is a result of the Lord doing these things. 
People say, well, that Antichrist and some of those things that happen there, that's just the world being messy. Yes, the world is messy, but you know why the things in tribulation specifically start to happen? Because Jesus starts opening the seals. If he never opened those seals, you wouldn't see those things happen. You see? It all begins because Jesus, the king, the rightful owner, starts to do it. By the way, who's squatting on the kingdoms of the world? Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, verse 17. Or 15, rather, is what I want. The seventh angel sounded, this being the seventh trumpet for those of you who know. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Right? Well, can't we sing that now? No, you can't. Couldn't they sing that back then when he was born in the manger? The kings of this world become... No, they couldn't. Okay. You can only sing that in Revelation 11 when the seals are open, he's reclaimed the land, and the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he will reign forever and ever. Right? Who, who's currently squatting in the authority of these kingdoms? The prince of the power of the air. Look at Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus came the first time, he was tempted of the devil. And what did the devil offer? Jesus, the one who would be worthy when he died on the cross and went to heaven to open the sealed book that he promised to Israel in the land. Who tempted him with the kingdoms of the world? Matthew 4, verse oh, 5. The devil takes him up to a, the holy city, sets him on a pinnacle of the temple, and says, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. That's not what I want. I want verse 8. The devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and says, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. That's when Jesus says, get thee hence, Satan. Same thing he says to Peter. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. The devil tempts Jesus, back here in Matthew 4, with the kingdoms of the world because he's in current possession of them. He's squatter's rights, right? Adam gave it up. Israel gave it up. They sinned. I'm here. I'm ruling the world. And God's whole purpose for the earth is to reclaim that. Rightfully. Not to usurp things, but legally. He becomes the kinsman redeemer. He, he seals that book and the scroll. He intervenes with the dispensation of grace to save the world, to develop that new creature. When he's done, he unseals that book, reclaims his right, and eventually the devil's cast out of those positions. And he says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God. That's the end. That's the consummation. That's the finishing of Daniel's 70th week. Right? That's the kingdom established. That's the everlasting righteousness. That's the anointing of the most holy right there. That's what that is. You see, that's the finishing of the controversy of Zion, which I yet to talk about. But all throughout prophecy, you, talk, you read about this controversy of Zion, this controversy of the land, the controversy of the people, and how it goes back and forth on whether they're God's people or not God's people. And the one day that'll be solved because all of Israel will be saved and the controversy will be settled and the documents will be unsealed and everyone will know that Christ is the king, he's the rightful owner, and it'll all be fulfilled. When you know that's the purpose of the tribulation events and the kingdom come, there should be no question, we are not a part of that. Right? We're not part of reclaiming the land. We're, we're going to heaven. We're preaching God's grace through Christ freely to all now. No matter what land or nationality you are. We have no earthly land that we're promised, right? The thing that you're sealed with is the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ till the day of redemption. That's great. You know those things, okay? We'll stop there and pick it up again next week. Any questions about any of that? You, Look, have, you left an unanswered question and said, why didn't Jesus do the, all that unsealing back there when he died? To reclaim the earth. Yeah, well, he, he, right. He had to ascend. He had to send the Holy Spirit. Okay. He knew the mystery would come. Right. There were things that had to be accomplished here. Okay. But you're right. Peter says in Acts 2, these are the last days. So what was supposed to happen next? Tribulation. Right. I mean, what starts this stuff? The sealing, the unsealing of the scroll and all that sort of business. So yeah, that should have happened. He had sent it to heaven. He sent out his Holy Spirit. Uh, Israel rejected Peter's gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, when he's, they said to repent for the restitution of all things is at hand, and they didn't. They stoned Stephen, they, they persecuted the apostles, and so Israel fell, and then God revealed the revelation as mystery to, to Paul. So this dispensation of grace is what intervened there. Right. And so that, there's 2,000 years. So if, if it were 2,000 years ago when he rose, rose from the dead, perhaps it would have been uh, 
more certain perhaps to the heavenly powers that he was the right one. But 2,000 years later, when he hasn't assumed that authority yet, now we've got a question on the table. The devil's been operating for 2,000 years, yeah. right? Whose right is it? You over here, you have the Antichrist, you have the false the prophet, you've got the devil over here inhabiting the things on the earth, and Christ is going to have to unseal that document to prove that he's the one. Yeah. Yes, sir. So if the, um, the, the cross is the end of the 380, or 483 years. That's right. It's after the 69th week he's cut off, right? Right. Is that the end of the, the 69th week of prophecy, or does it not end until the mystery is revealed? Um, if you do the calculation, and, and this is where people talk about the, the details, uh, what I quoted to you from Zechariah 9 about his writing into Jerusalem, Messiah the Prince, that's, that's the 69th week ending. Uh, Daniel 9, 26, I think, says after, 25, says after the 69th week, Messiah will be cut off. And so you, you have a literal one week, seven days here, after the 69th week, he's cut off. So 69th week is over here, after the 69th week, he's cut off, and so the 70th week, is, is after the 69th. And so uh, th th that's, that's the prophetic. So verse 27, when it mentions the middle of that week, I was, I was assuming that was a week of years. That's right. That's, that's a week of days, is what you're saying. No, 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 no that's 70th week's week of years. So there's a seven year, a 70 year, a 70th week, a tribulation. So what, right. what, what, in my head I'm thinking though, is that we're half of the way through the tribul tri tribulation 70th week, is that? Oh, the dispensation of grace? Right. That's so what you're saying? Really yeah. Yeah, good question. I didn't deal with it, but yeah, this is what the conversation uh, it, it can, it is, is about. Is about what happened after the 69th week. If you have uh, seven years after Matthew 21, you're into the dispensation of grace. I mean, you're smack dab right in the middle here. Nothing happened there. Okay, it was 70 years after this that Jerusalem was destroyed. So 70 years doesn't match anything in the 70th week, right? right? And so the teaching is that there was a gap. Okay, there was a gap between the 69th and 70th week, and that's going to take another, another hour to explain, but there, there was a gap, there was a, 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 an interruption. It says after the 69th week, this happens, after the 69th week, this happens, and if this happens after the 69th week, that means it had to happen before the 70th week. And so there's this gap in prophecy between the 69th and 70th week. Right, not only that, but you saw the city and the sanctuary being destroyed, then you see the sacrifice existing again. How do you rebuild the temple in seven years? This, is, this didn't happen. And it hasn't happened. And so anyway, the conclusion is that there's a gap, a prophetic gap. And, and that, by the way, which you've correctly identified, is what the opponents to hold this whole conversation say, well, that's ridiculous. Why is there a gap? It must have, just it just must have finished 2,000 years ago. The problem with that is if you make that 70th week finish seven years after the 69th week, there's nothing, there's no event that happened there. And you have to say we're living in the kingdom now, and all the sins are dealt with now. And so it doesn't match Daniel 9.24. And so the necessity of Daniel 9.24 being literally about this, Daniel 9.24, implies, necessitates a gap, a separation within the 69th and 70th week. It's not, you don't see the gap in Daniel 9, so you can't read that and find it there. It's not there. But it necessitates it. Just like when we talk about Acts 2 at Pentecost, and Peter says these are the last days, right? These are the last days, and these things are going to be fulfilled. But then 2,000 years later, we haven't seen them fulfilled. Why do we, why do we, well, there's got to have been a postponement, an interruption. Yes. It's the same thinking. Yeah. But, you know, when you're back here reading Daniel 9, Daniel didn't see that. And Peter didn't see that in Acts 2. He didn't see the, the, the gap of the mystery. He didn't see it. These are the last days. Now we can see that it's been interrupted here and here. The prophecy's been interrupted. When we say prophecy has been interrupted by the mystery, the totality of prophecy, Pentecost, Daniel 70th week, prophecy Stop. stopped. You know, so the counting stopped, everything stopped. Uh, that's the dispensational position anyway. A any thoughts? Yes, sir. What about somewhere I've, I've ran across this thought or something that I've read, but in Christ's earthly ministry when he um, was talking about the parable of uh, the fig tree and basically give it another year, mm -hmm. does that fit into the Daniel's timetable? Does that work out with that too? Um, or is that more of a... Not, not really. Okay. Uh, not really. Uh, p people talk about if there's the whole seven years still future or if kind of maybe he was alluding to that there was a little bit of time here before Paul, you know, that year. So maybe there's only six years left in the future. People spec that back and forth. I don't know if we can be adamant about one, one way or another. But yeah, Jesus did talk about giving it another year, which seems to be after his cross yeah, to when they like stone Stephen. Yeah. In there, but I didn't know if that fit into Daniel's necessarily yeah. or whether that was a... Yeah, it, it's an interesting study. Um, I, 
I don't know if God had to be pleaded to give them a second chance just because they were going to crucify Christ anyway. He was going to send his spirit anyway, according to prophecy. So I, I don't know if God would, God would not have brought in the tribulation here anyway. But it kind of fits so, with Acts 3 when Peter does. says, repent, and you know, he'll, yeah. Christ will come. And it's yeah. kind of that same. So if anything, it's more of a prophecy and not a pleading. The, the parable there has to do with the son pleading to the father and that sort of thing. So I, I don't think it was God pleading to God, oh, please postpone your prophetic wrath. God's wrath wasn't going to come in Acts 2. Anyway. But it could be talking about that year being, a, that's how long it'll be. So that could have been for Israel. They could have heard that and said, well, it's going to be another, another opportunity here. Which, which puts, places a limit on how long Israel had to believe, repent. Right. When Peter does repent, how long do they have to repent? So does the rapture kind of end that age of mystery and trigger the 70th week? Because no. Okay. No. Um, what the rapture does, what the catching away of the church does, is indicates the end of God's operation through the church. So in that sense, he's resuming prophecy. But the catching away itself is not a trigger of these prophetic events. It's not the beginning of the tribulation. And there is also over here an unknown gap. Okay, because these tribulation and the events here, there's events that happen that are clearly explained. And it's not the rapture. So the rapture happens and these things got to occur first. We simply don't know this time here. Will it happen the day after the rapture? 20 years after the rapture? We don't know. There's nothing in the prophecy that says that. Since prophecy has been interrupted, we don't know when it will resume. We only know it's going to be after he's done doing what he's doing now. After this, but we don't know when then. So, but in that gap of time, it would be a correct thing to be looking for things to be moving towards, pointing towards the... If we were here. That's right. We right. Were, <laughs> yeah. right. I, I'm talking about <clears throat> those that Bible are. studiers during that period of time, which will if not they be exist. the body of Christ. If they exist. Right, and that's what I'm saying, if they exist. Um, that's a good question to ask. I mean, what does the world look like at this time? You do not have saved people. Anybody on the planet is not saved. And well, how are they Bible not saved? Studiers now that are saved. This so is true. This is true. And so there could be, you know, a religious system of unsaved people. Um, but again, you're, I mean, those people who have a Bible, you know, is it pure? Is it not corrupted? You know, it, are they studying it correctly? And when they're studying it, what they're going to fall into Here's the summary. The people who are going to be saved out of this tribulation are going to have to be Israel and the people who follow Israel. Okay? And the people who reject the coming Messiah here. Okay? That's the Antichrist. Another lesson. But there's going to be a person coming up here that, that we know is the Antichrist only because we know this is the Christ and that must be the Antichrist. But to those people studying the Bible wrongly, looking for a Christ or looking for his return, thinking that they're in the tribulation, what are they expecting next? that Christ to come, here comes this Messiah. Seed. Yeah. And so this is a problem for them, you see. So if they didn't understand this, how are they going to understand that? You know, so the only way for the, the people to get right here is if they understand all of this. You know. Or if, or if God, like we see in the prophecies, he resurrects people, he sends the two witnesses, and they start preaching to them. I mean, there's going to have to be a choice made here. It, I, I don't see it, and I think it's kind of a, a hard thing for me to grasp, that people here are going to be studying this chart, and that's how, how they're going to know this is happening. I think God's going to have to shock things to, to start again. I mean, he, he's, he's going to set a choice to people, just like he did in the past, where there's a, there's a statue, and they either bow down or didn't bow down, right? Or, or they choose this day whom they're going to serve. And so there's going to be two witnesses over here. There's going to be uh, 144,000 Jews. There's going to be an option here where they're going to choose who they're going to serve, either this guy or God. I mean, the gospel over here, if you read the gospel the angels preach, fear God, keep his commandments, that seems, it seems like a step back almost. And we're preaching God's grace and how we're all sinners, and they're preaching to fear God, keep his, you know, fear, fear God and give glory to him. So there's going to be a simple choice. Go with the world system or sacrifice it all, maybe even your life, and fear God. You know, and it's going to require that sacrifice. But Paul says so. even with that choice that they'll believe the lie. Yeah, second Thessalonians 2, yeah. Those who rejected the gospel will believe the lie, yeah. So, I mean, the point I'm trying to, to point out is that, yeah, there'll be the Bible here, probably. There'll be people here um, uh, who get saved, even. There'll be lots of those saved out of Great Tribulation. You know, how did they get saved? It's not according to the mystery information. It's going to be according to their fearing God, identifying Jesus as the Christ, you know, um, them sacrificing what they have. You know, today we preach sacrifice of what you have, but it's not a requirement. 
there it will be. I mean, there's no way, I don't, in prophecy, there's not going to be a way for them to live like we do now, okay, then, and be saved. You know, so. You would think that after the rapture, the people that were studying their Bible but didn't understand would be like, we missed it. You know, is that going to be, do you think, a trigger for some of those people in that gap yeah. period of time? Yeah, it may be. We don't know. I mean, we don't know if, if uh, how public this event's going to be and what kind of response is going to be to it. Um, again, you, you, the Left Behind series kind of intimated that as well, where the rapture happened and there's people saying, whoa, you know, I heard my wife talking about this. They go to the church and they listen to my video online and they go, wow, Justin mentioned this. You know, now I know that I can be saved. Well, <laughs> God's not doing this anymore. You know, so if you're here, you're kind of stuck. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you if you're living here. I don't know. Uh, I know what to say here. Trust Christ, his death and resurrection. I don't know what to say here. I mean, you got judgment coming. And apparently you deserve it. So, <laughs> tough cookies. I don't know what to say. You look for the angel from heaven. You know? But that's going to be hard because there's going to be devils there too. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you. That's why um, it's called the tribulation. Right. That's the, that's the judgment and, the, and the, the purging and everything else. So, I mean... The only thing they have is what anybody else had outside of the mystery, which was plead to God for mercy. Confess your sins. Plead to God. Do what the guys in Revelation 6 don't do, repent, you know, but, but yeah. Sorry, I know you're trying to wrap up, but what is the Holy Spirit function in that time, or is there any? Tell me, is sure. All... Yeah, sure. Well, you think of what happened at Pentecost uh, over here, and that'll be the power that's given to the people who are believers here. So, you know, it, it's a great conversation where we're getting to a whole other lesson. You know, what happens to the believers here? What, what do they look like? Um, well, they look like this over here. You know, how do you identify? First John talked about how do you identify true believers and false believers, right? Well, you know them by their works. You'll know them by the power of the Spirit. Um, is it First John that says that? You'll know them by the Spirit that they have and the unction that they have. And so you can identify them by that. You'll know them because they're Jewish. Yeah. Well, at the beginning, right, yeah. 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 So, I mean, you'll be able to identify them by their fruits, and those fruits would be the Spirit's working. Um, First John says they'll, you'll know that they have the Spirit of God when they confess that Jesus was the Christ. He was manifest in the flesh. So when they confess that Jesus here was the Christ, you know, that nobody of the false spirit here will be able to say that because they'll say that this guy is the Christ. Right? And so that's how you'll be able to identify them there. Of course, you won't be there. Uh, but yeah, so the, the folks here, that they'll have to identify this Jesus as the Christ, not this Jesus, which would be very strange. I mean, already we're seeing, an, uh, you are anachronistic, you are old-fashioned, you are out of touch with reality, according to the society in this world. I mean, you believe a guy a thousand years ago, you believe everything in the Bible, that's ridiculous, right? So I don't know what the conditions of the world will be here, but they will have to believe that was the Christ, and he came in the flesh, even though there's a guy here that raises from the dead. And the world goes, well, that guy's obviously the Christ. Uh, I don't believe it. So you're going to deny what you see for what you, you read? The, I mean, that, that's, I just can't imagine what that's, what that's like. Uh, but there will be people saved out of it, apparently. So praise God for that. Any thoughts? You got people dying, judgment happening, the devil, devilish activity. You got the Holy Spirit empowering believers to live and survive in the wilderness. Um, very different what God's doing now. All right, any, any final thoughts? Yeah. Sorry. Um, this reminds me of how when there's the 400 years of silence before Christ comes in the fulfillment, they were looking at, I picture them, like the wise men, mm -hmm. drawing up charts like this, and hey, he's going to be coming soon. And they didn't know, even with all their wisdom, what exactly how he was going to come, because they looked for him in a temple. Uh -huh. You know, and I feel like, our hindsight is 2020, yep. and so like when they get there, they're gonna look at the Bible and be like, "Yeah, this is what they meant." Right. But us looking forward, we can't know. Yep. Like we, this is all kind of like speculation, yep. and yep. maybe this is how it's gonna happen. But that's like, right. For us to be definitive, it's it's like the, the wise men were a lot smarter than us and didn't get it right with Christ. Right. And I feel like we're not gonna know. Well, that's what I said at the first lesson. I said that we're speaking about the future, and since it's in the future, we don't know except what the Bible says, and there's lots of things there that seem to be vague. 
uh, you know, Daniel talks about that, where he seals up the book and it says they won't know until the end. And so, yeah, when you're over here, I'm sure it makes a lot more sense. You know, we're talking about what's going to look like. I don't really know. What I know what it looks like now, you know, I know that because I live here and God's told me what's going on. I, I know what the prophecy says, the big picture, but getting down to the details, I can't tell you how long that gap is or exactly how much the 70th week is gone. I don't know because it's not over yet. You know, they'll know then, looking back and say, yeah, that's exactly what God said. So, yeah, I think you're right. There's a little bit of mystery to it. It's that mystery of God in relation to it. All right, anything else? Lord, we thank you for your prophecy. We thank you that uh, you've given us a hope of salvation, of resurrection, and of heavenly places. Uh, you've delivered us from the wrath to come. We thank you for your righteous judgment on the earth, knowing that the, the things that we see now and the troubles that we face are, are able to be dealt with by you in righteous judgment. And we, we trust on that. And meanwhile, we're here representing your grace to the world. Help us to preach that to folks. Help them to see the reality of righteousness and the reality of sin in their lives and the need for a Savior. We thank you for the church and their operation and work and ministry together. Amen. Thank you, folks.